Bibles with you. Uh, turn to Hosea chapter 4. The book of Hosea chapter 4. Uh, I'm not a very good cook. Uh, if you ask Gabby, uh, she'll tell you that. I'm not, I, I enjoy cooking, I enjoy baking, but I'm not super good at it. But I want you to imagine with me for a second that I am a ridiculously stupid baker for a second. Let's say that I have a recipe, and I were to take that recipe, and I were to say, you know what, I'm going to follow this recipe. I'm going I'm to do what this recipe says, but I'm going to do it the way that I want. So let's say that this recipe is for a cake. Right? I take all the ingredients for the cake, I have the flour, I have the eggs, I have the vanilla, I have everything that I need to bake a cake. So I take half of those ingredients, I put them in the pan, and I'm excited, I, I walk over to the oven, and, and I put that in the oven for an hour. Only half of the ingredients. After an hour, I, I come over to the oven, I take it out, and it, it's not looking too great. But it's going to get better because I'm going to put the, the other half of the ingredients in. It's going to be fine. It's going to be great. So I, I put the other half in and I walk back over to the oven. I put it back in there for another hour and I wait, wait. Oven dings. I walk over. I, I open the oven back up. I take it out. I put it on the table. How many of you are going to eat that cake? None of us. Why? I put all the ingredients in. I did everything right. I, I did everything that I was supposed to do but I did it out of order. The book of Hosea is a really, really interesting book. In the first few chapters of Hosea, God tells Hosea to go and marry a woman who's a harlot, a woman who, who's a woman of the night, a, a woman who, who, who people pay for, for, for sexual pleasure. And God tells Hosea, Hosea, no matter how unfaithful that woman is to you, I want you to be faithful to her. And what a beautiful picture of how God treats us, that no matter how far we get from him, no matter how, how much we do to disappoint him, no matter how much we do that grieves his Holy Spirit, he's always willing to bring us back to him with open arms. So God tells Hosea to, to marry this woman, but here's the thing, that woman, what, what she was doing was not uncommon in that time. The nation of Israel was absolutely ridiculous during this time. I mean, fornication was everywhere. There was adultery. People were sleeping with other people's uh, spouses. Child sacrifice was not uncommon. There was lying. There was murder. It was a wicked and terrible place. Say, Nick, that sounds a lot like America right now. And you wouldn't be wrong. But it's interesting. We get to Hosea chapter 4. I want you to read what it says. Hear the word of the Lord, ye children of Israel. For the Lord hath a controversy with the inhabitants of the land. Because. Now, if I'm Hosea, I'm getting ready. Because I, I know God's about to say something. I mean, God literally just said, Hosea, I'm going to tell you what the problem that I have with Israel right now is. I'm going to tell you what the problem is. I'm going I'm to tell you. And Hosea's getting ready. He's like, oh, man, what's it? is it going to be the fornication? Is it going to be the, 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 the people sleeping around? Is it going to be the lying? Is it gonna, what is it going to be? And look at what God says to Hosea. He says, because there's no truth, nor mercy, nor knowledge of God in the land. These three things are so important that later on in Micah chapter 6, uh, uh, verses number 6 and 8, he, re he re reiterates them. God says the problem he has in Israel in Micah chapter 6, he says, what, what, what does the Lord require of thee but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God? So let's look at these three ingredients to experiencing revival in America. First of all, God said that there was no truth. God's people were not standing for God's truth. You say, that sounds like America. I mean, it, it, we, we have so many issues in America. And many of you, when I was explaining what Israel was like, you were, you were thinking in your mind, man, that sounds just like America. Man, we have abortion, uh, the child sacrifice for our own convenience. We have that everywhere. People are doing exactly what they're doing in Israel. But guys, let me remind you, we can have all of the prayer meetings. We can have all of the prayer marches. We can have all the pro-life marches. We can have everything, and we can do everything right. But if we are not obsessed with truth, it doesn't matter. That's right. 
All those things are good, and I'm not taking away from them. I'm not saying that prayer marches and prayer meetings and praying for revival is bad, but if it doesn't come from our hearts and if we're not obsessed with the truth of this book, none of it matters. None of it. We look at the world and we criticize for a second, but for a moment, I want you to think not about America, but about your heart. Are you obsessed with truth? And you can't tell me that you're obsessed with truth unless you're obsessed with this book. Jesus said when he was praying to his father, Lord, sanctify them by, sanctify them by your truth, for your word is and unless we, as Christians, as God's people, are obsessed with God's truth, we will never experience revival. God said that there was no truth. He also said there's no mercy. I wonder, as Christians, have we forgotten what God's done for us? Guys, we all preached the gospel in the past couple weeks. We all preached the mercy that God's had on us. And we preach the gospel to sinners, but I wonder how often it is that we preach the gospel to ourselves. How often is it that we remind ourselves of the mercy that God has had on us in our own life? I want you to think about every time that you've sinned, every time that you've broken God's heart, every time that you spat in God's face and he's welcomed you back. Jesus tells a great story in Matthew chapter 18. It says there was a, there was a master and the, ser- the, the master calls the servant, oh, this, his servant over to him and he says, you owe me 10,000 uh, 10, talents. So pay up. Pay me. Pay me what you owe me. And the servant pleads with his master. He says, Master, I, I can't pay you right now. I don't, have, I don't have what it takes to pay you. But I promise if you give me more time, I'll pay you. The master sits there. And he says, you know what? You're good to go. You don't owe me anything. Your debt's paid. Guys, that's what God's done for us. He's paid our debt. We owe nothing anymore. But then that servant goes over to his fellow servant who owed him a hundred pence and said, pay up. And the man said the exact same thing that the servant before said. He said, no, I can't pay you right now. I can't do what you need me to right now, but I promise you I'll pay you back when I can and the servant took that other servant, threw his, him in jail, and sold his wife and his children. No mercy. I wonder how often is it that you reach out to a needy student on campus? How, how often is it that you show the love of Christ to your fellow Christians? How often is it that when somebody comes to you and they need help, that you say, okay, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to take all the time that you need because Jesus took all the time that I need. Or when someone comes to you and they say, look, I need help, I'm hurting. We say, you know, I'm, I'm a little too busy for you. We will never experience revival without truth. We will never experience revival without mercy. And I'm not talking about a nation. I'm talking about yourself. I'm talking about myself. There's no truth. There was no mercy. And thirdly, there was no knowledge of God. They didn't know who he was. They didn't know him intimately. They didn't spend time with him. In Philippians chapter 3, verse number 10, Paul said that his whole goal in life was to know Jesus Christ. How many of us can say that's our goal? How many of us can say that my, the, that my whole purpose of living is to know my Savior better? I don't know that I could say that. Because we have things that we desire. We have things that we want. We have things that, 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 that we want to do. But Paul said, no, no, no. None of those things matter because my purpose in life is to know Jesus better. They didn't know God. And guys, We'll never experience corporate revival. We'll never experience this nation come back to Jesus. Unless first we experience personal revival in these three things. 
until we get obsessed with truth, until we get obsessed with this book, until we get obsessed with, with obeying what God has told us to do in his word, we will never experience corporate revival. Until we get obsessed with treating others how Jesus treated us, we will never experience corporate revival. And until we get obsessed with knowing who Jesus is and knowing who God is and having a knowledge of God's heart, we will never experience revival. So you say, what's the answer? How do we experience revival? If you notice, these three things, these three ingredients to revival are not crazy things that you've never heard before. They're fairly simple. Obsessed with truth. Love mercy. Walk humbly with your God. Because, guys, revival doesn't, revival isn't this mystery thing that God's holding out there that, that he, he doesn't want us to find. Revival comes when you obey God every day and do the things that he's asked you to do. Revival comes when you obey his word. Revival comes when you love Jesus more than you love yourself. When you love others more than you love yourself. Revival is simple. It's not complicated. So let's live this verse out. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time that I had uh, with my fellow classmates. And I'm thankful for your reprimand to Israel in Hosea chapter 4. He told them that there was, there was no truth. There was no mercy. They weren't loving it to others. And they didn't know you. Father, I pray that we will be a people that desire to have these three things in our life. That we'll be obsessed with the truths of your word. That, that we'll love mercy. That we'll love others. That we'll share the love of Christ with other people. And that our desire will be to know who you are. Father, I love you. I'm so thankful for you. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.